Welcome to the Stone Cold Truth. This is Roger Stone back in the saddle after a couple weeks on the road uh, promoting the making of the president 2016, how Donald Trump orchestrated an American revolution. Uh, I've got to tell you, I've I've met a lot of really fine people uh, on these uh, book road trips. Uh, Great trip through Palm Springs, Los Angeles, New York, and D.C. Uh, Back on the road next week to um, Orlando, Florida, where... Yes, I am opening for um, my friend Rick Derringer uh, and uh, the Edgar Winter Band featuring Edgar Winter. Uh, It's not as good as it sounds. I'm talking, they're playing. But in any event, uh, thank you for joining us here. Uh, It has uh, been an extraordinary week for me because I was the subject of an orchestrated hit job in the national media. See, it works like this. Uh, a, a publication called The Smoking Gun publishes a story with a false premise saying that because I had contact with the uh, alleged Russian hacker, let's we'll just call him a hacker because that's unproven, the hacker uh, Grucifer 2.0 on Twitter, that that constitutes collusion because Grucifer was involved in the hacking of the DNC, documents later dropped by WikiLeaks. The problem with this narrative is that my cursory and innocuous exchange on Twitter with someone claiming to be Grucifer 2 comes only after the documents have already been published by Wiki and after I identify Grucifer's role publicly uh, in a piece I wrote for the Breitbart News. So in order to collude, I would have needed a time machine, something Comrade Putin has not yet perfected. Uh, this, is, this smear is part and parcel of an effort, uh, a slow motion coup that is based on a false premise. How ironic that the exact week that it becomes clear that our intelligence services had the Republican candidate for president, Donald J. Trump, under surveillance... Their rationale and their reason for such surveillance collapses publicly. They do not have, in Roger Stone or anyone else, proof of collusion with the Russians. The New York Times wrote on August 20th, uh, and again, I believe on the 30th, that uh, the uh, intelligence agencies were in possession of uh, email messages, records of financial transactions, and telephone intercepts, which proved uh, the collusion. Funny, uh, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, uh, Devin Nunes, says he has not seen them. The New York Times has not seen them. They reported their existence, but they have not seen them. And if this stretch of my exchanging a banal uh, 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 exchange, which I have released the direct messages entirely, while I may look a little pompous, the government looks pretty foolish This constitutes collusion, not. Plus, it happened after the fact. You cannot have an ex post facto collusion. Uh, It it is typical of the smears that we see. Now, as soon as the smoking gun printed this, you know, MSNBC, the the leftist agate prop posing as a news organization, uh, GQ, I'm disappointed in those those fellows, uh, the Washington Times, to their credit, they did an update and reflecting both sides of this story, uh, and I salute them for that. But they and many other, like Raw Story and all these lefty recycle joints, put the stuff up. And, of course, here is the desired headline. FBI has uh, proof of stone contact with Russian agent. Please give me a break. As I have made very clear... Uh, I have not met with any Russians, certainly not anyone from the Russian state or Russian intelligence. I have not met with any Russian citizens or Russian businessmen. I have not met with uh, with uh, any intermediary for any of the above. Uh, I don't uh, have a Russian girlfriend. I don't like Russian dressing on my salad. And frankly, I have now stopped drinking Russian vodka because you know what they might say. This is the worst form of McCarthyism, whether it is Jerry Nadler or Elijah Cummings or John Podesta or the smoking gun. 
they have no proof. In this case, the smoking gun has sought uh, to um, manufacture proof. It is clear, by the way, that they are the uh, beneficiary of a leak. If it is a leak based on a FISA warrant, as I believe it is, they're now in violation of the law and subject to a felony conviction. You see, leaking goes uh, both ways. Uh, and the intelligence agencies are leaking like a sieve, uh, and now their game has been exposed. Yes, Donald Trump was under surveillance. Yes, the cover-up, just like the Watergate cover-up, will take a long time to pierce. But sooner or later, Mr. Brennan, Mr. Clapper, uh, the Ash Carter, the Secretary of Defense, and uh, uh, Loretta Lynch, perhaps the president, former president himself, should be compelled to testify in front of a grand jury. I'm prepared to do so. I'm prepared to tell the grand jury about my involvement with the Russians, except for it doesn't exist. At the end of the day, if there was a FISA court warrant, well, then the uh, my civil liberties have been violated. My, uh, my uh, privacy rights have been violated. Uh, the government would be in a position to learn a lot of things. It's funny how many of these small details regarding my business were reflected in the smoking gun piece, further proof that they have been in receipt of an illegal leak. Uh, so it, it is um, is disappointing, but it is, of course, historic. The folks at the CIA lied about torture during the Iraq war. They lied about rendition. They lied about uh, Benghazi uh, and the attack on our mission being a, an act of mob violence. Uh, they lied about weapons of mass destruction uh, in Saddam Hussein. Uh, and they have a long history of lying. They lied about the Vietnam War. They lied about the Gulf of Tonkin. They lied about, about uh, 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 Chile and Guatemala. They lied about Watergate. They have lied throughout their entire uh institutional history. This is what spies do. Anyway, we have a great show for you today. We'll be joined by my uh, friend Tyler Nixon. Uh, we have Dr. Jerome Corsi joining us. Uh, we, uh, we have surprises in store for you, so I thank you for joining us. I do want to remind you, as I do at every turn, that you can still uh, acquire your mint copy of The Making of the President 2016. I'm very proud of this book. Uh, and if you want to know the truth about the Trump campaign and the Russians, well, here it is. It's all there ad nauseum. Obviously, this latest smear job on me is not included, but who knows? In the second edition, we may have to go there, uh, as they say. And Roger, you have Tricky Dick coming out this summer, right? Exactly, to, to Tyler Nixon. I'm I am sorry, I got into a, I got on a, I got on my high horse there because. No, it's great to have you the, back. The, the, the feeling of violation you have when somebody's gone through all your correspondence. I remember when I lived in Arlington, Virginia, in this small wooden old house that my wife and I rented from a guy named Jess Bushyhead, who was an Indian, Native American. It was a great property. It was inexpensive. But one day while we were at work, we were burglarized, and they went through everything in our home. And the feeling of violation then, which made me sick to my stomach, is the same feeling that I have now of somebody reading my email and my texts. You, Tyler, as a civil libertarian, can certainly Yes, and, I, and I've been under government surveillance myself in the past, uh, which we you know about, uh, which we can certainly certainly get into in future shows. But uh, it, it is. You feel violated. You feel like, uh, you know, what, what are these people like just uh, totally invading your space invading your your reality really it's not it's worse than a physical violation well uh, i was happy to, i was happy to, to know i was going to be with you today because i know you've always had a unique perspective on delaware politics and i want to talk to you about big happenings in the biden family that i read about this past week sure well uh you know i'll tell you and we gotta we gotta go, go into a break here in a few seconds but um you know i think you're gonna ultimately as well as president trump uh, contribute to the unmasking of how they manufacture news uh, in the media complex and the uh, intelligence complex, uh, how this is all done. And it's really being exposed, I think, piece by piece and, and really how shallow and fake it, it truly is. But so, uh, yeah, we do have a great show coming up. Lee Stranahan is going to be up next from uh, he hosts the uh, Breitbart, uh, Breitbart Sunday evening show. And um, he's going to he's going to uh, 
going to give us some insights. So stay with us here on the Stone Cold Truth Radio. Welcome back to the Stone Cold Roger Truth Stone here on the... is a very interesting guy. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to bump into the Reverend Al, but... Um... In any event, uh, we are we are pleased to have with us uh, one of the top investigative journalists in the country. Uh, Lee Stranahan works for Breitbart News, and uh, to my mind, has done incredible research into uh, issues in the Middle East and other, uh, both domestic and foreign issues. He has been more knowledgeable on the questions of the uh, so-called uh, uh, hacking of uh, of. Uh, the Democratic National Committee, still a very controversial issue. The media continues to say, well, the Russians did that. There is no evidence of that. But I asked him to join us today because uh, I want to really clarify the role of a Grucifer 2.0, who is cited in all these stories trashing me today, uh, all leading with the headline, Stone admits that he was in contact with Russian hacker but never mentioning that it was after the fact and therefore collusion with him would be impossible. Plus, I've made the exchange most innocuous uh, and innocent public. So it's a smear job, but I want people to understand the etymology of it. Lee, thanks for joining us here at the Stone Cold Truth. Roger, thanks very much for having me. Appreciate it. So if you would tell uh, our listeners exactly who Grucifer 2.0 is, uh, and what it is that he has allegedly done. Well, and his connection to you, too, because I know quite a bit about that as well. So let's let's talk about that. So Gustafer II is the entity. I'll call it an entity because I don't know if it's a man-woman organization. I don't know who it is. I've contacted Gustafer II as well. And uh, I don't know who they are, but they're the person who's behind the DNC and the DCCC hackings. Now, I happen to know this because uh, Guccifer 2 gave me information that was released about a week later. So in other words, they gave me information, said, here's some documents. Uh, I looked at them. We held on to them. And then about a week later, they were released publicly through that through the uh, WikiLeaks hack and then through it, but, through, but also through through WikiLeaks, but also through Bruce Perdue themselves. Okay, so uh, I, but the thing that's important to clarify here is Guccifer II, we know had the data, but also has claimed responsibility for hacking the DNC. So in that sense, the the mystery solved. We 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 know who did it. It's Guccifer II. Now, what this group CrowdStrike has said, CrowdStrike is you get, and if you remember who they are, CrowdStrike is the organ that have a big story in Breitbart about this a couple days ago. CrowdStrike is the group who was hired by the DNC. In other words, they're employees of the DNC to uh, counter this hacking. And they say that Guccifer II is the Russian government. It's essentially Vladimir Putin. That's what CrowdStrike says. Now, there is zero proof of this, no proof whatsoever. But furthermore, there's, there's contra-proof which is the group, and uh, CrowdStrike calls the group Fancy Bear. Fancy Bear has done a number of hacks. Has been, it's, it's really, that it's, a, it, it's more complex. It's not really people. It's really more a, a, a method. But the Fancy Bear threat has been used on a number of hacks, but they never did what this Guccifer II person did. Guccifer II, this entity person, whoever it is, created an online persona, created a Twitter account, created a WordPress account, talked to people, talked to me, talked to you, talked to other reporters. This cannot be stressed enough, Roger. Uh, a number of reporters talked to Guccifer, too, not just the infamous Roger Stone. And well, what's, what's, it, what's interesting, what's interesting uh, Lee, is that, is that exact point. Uh, you, you have raised yes. an excellent point there. I mean, does anybody contact the Hill and ask them if they're collaborating because they've been in touch with him? Or, uh, but, or me. Or, 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 but, the, but the Hill absolutely, before I did, weeks before I did, this is how I got on to Guccifer. And I can also say that uh, I think probably the first time you really heard about Guccifer was through me when I contacted you and I said, I think this is a story you should 
Yeah, no, we uh, began. You know, no, no, no. You were, you were, uh, you vetted every piece of that story, and it is rock solid even today. Uh, of course, you have there's some denial. I don't believe that all the documents that came out of the DNC came by hack. I believe Craig Murray, the British diplomat, who says that he was handed off documents from a disgruntled employee in a parking lot or a wooded area near American University. I believe that that to, I believe that young man, the informant, to be. Seth Rich. Uh, but that doesn't mean there was no hacking. And to the extent that there was, I'm convinced that Grucifer 2.0 did the initial hacking. He proved that to you, in essence. So uh, it is, uh, but this idea that, that you could have collusion is just a smear. My contact with him is innocuous, and it comes long after these documents are already in the mainstream. Again, what they're well, trying to claim is what they're trying to claim is that we somehow coordinated the timing or the content of WikiLeaks disclosures, and that is nonsense. Just nonsense. Well, and the time the timing is ridiculous in two ways. Number one, as you say, you were in contact with Guzzaberg not only after the hack was done, but after, as you say, the Hill had publicized it. And many other organizations had publicized and done interviews with them. But but more, but just as important, your uh, role as a Trump advisor had been over for how long? Like, uh, m- months, at least. Well, at least on a fo- it- uh, at least on a formal basis. I, I don't think that I don't think many people hold to that standard because I was and am an unabashed supporter of our new president. I have wanted him to run for but- president since 1988. So whether I was uh, whether I w- had a formal role or didn't, I was certainly a partisan, and I certainly had access to the highest levels of his campaign. The problem here is yeah. that th- this is a scandal without evidence. This is a scandal searching for evidence. We've reached the conclusion: the Russians, uh, you know, uh, coordinated with the Trump people, colluded with them to affect the outcome of the election. The problem is there is just no evidence of this whatsoever. None. And, and, and again, they're trying to tie you into it. And again, I've noticed, but what they do is they reduce it. They they reduce. If you look at Slate's headline right now, uh, the big headline is not Roger Stone. It's Trump advisor. You have become Trump advisor. And again, this is the it's the sort of it's the sort of smear. Again, obviously, you're a big supporter. You certainly were a formal advisor at one point, but not when not when this occurred. Uh, and. It's again. It's just an attempt to confuse the general public. Let's face what's going on here, Roger. This is an attempt by the media and by the Democrats. And I got to point out again, the, all the evidence that this comes from Russia comes from this group, CrowdStrike, who was literally employed by the Democrats. That's not a conspiracy. That's just the fact. Uh, this is all an effort to destroy Trump's agenda to diminish his presidency, to diminish his win, and to confuse the general public. And so that you've been pulled into it later uh, is is stunning. But uh, it, it's just an example of how desperate they've become. You know, I've been doing these White House press briefings. I've been in the White House at these press briefings. And you can see it in the media every day, yeah. you know, question after question about the Russians. And they have Lee, nothing. I hate to interrupt you. We're coming up on a on a uh, on a station break here, but uh, we'll, Roger will be on tomorrow night with you. Yeah, great. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, Roger. Uh, yes, I think indeed. We're John Phillips up next. Lee, we appreciate you coming on on the show. You bet. Thanks, well, guys. Yep. We we'll hope to have you back. You're listening to Stone Cold Truth Radio. Welcome back to the Stone Cold Truth this here on the Sanders, Genesis. And you're listening to the Stone Cold. Truth. I did it again. I keep stepping on my bumper. All right. Uh, this, is, this is Roger Stone. Uh, I am uh, uh, here with my uh, sidekick, Tyler Nixon. Uh, and now we are privileged to have KABC's John Phillips. John Phillips is a, a, a political analyst for CNN. Um, he's also one of the smartest guys I know. And one of the really the first people in the media who saw the viability of Donald Trump's candidacy, someone who said from the beginning, really the same time as my friend Ann Coulter, no, Trump is going to be the next president. So, John Phillips, thanks for joining us, and I hope you brought your crystal ball again. (laughs) Thanks for the kind introduction. Happy to be here. So, uh, how do you think the new president is doing? 
What what is your how would you grade him at this point? I think he's doing a fantastic job. I mean, look, he's an outsider. He's never been in public office before, so there's going to be a learning curve, but that's what the public wanted when they voted for him. And the media keeps fixating on all of these things that that, that he uh, hasn't come through on, all of these quote-unquote broken promises. Um, the supporters out there, I think, don't see it that way. I certainly don't. Um, I think that, that on the stuff that we care about, on the big ticket items, on the agenda items that got people to go to his rallies and turn out and vote for him, he is coming through. He said he was going to kill TPP. That's one of the first things he did. He said he was going to pick a Supreme Court justice off the list that he provided us. That's exactly what he did. He said he was going to build the wall and bring back extreme vetting. He's moved on those two things. So I personally couldn't be happier. Uh, so what do you make of, you know, the um, the near revolt in the streets we keep hearing about and the fact that you really can't go out in polite society without getting into a fight with somebody, if they rec- in my case, if they recognize you? Uh, and the, the entire, I don't know, the, the, the level of intolerance uh, and the continued seeming, you know, hardcore opposition to the mainstream media doesn't seem to have budged an inch. I mean, is that real? Is it fake? Is it? 48% of the people, who is it? Well, it's the people that hated him before the election. They hated him before the election. They hate. They didn't vote for him, and they hate him after the election, and their hatred has, has done nothing but intensified. But I think they need to be careful about this mob that they're ginning up, because I don't think that their mob can damage Trump, because no one in the streets, no one at these rallies, no one at these town hall events are Trump supporters that have turned on him. These are all Hillary Clinton people. They're Bernie people. They're people that voted for Jill Stein. And the, the, the place where they can have the biggest impact is in Democratic Party primaries. And they're going to be defending 10 seats in the U.S. Senate in the upcoming midterm elections that represent states, uh, or senators that represent states that Donald Trump won. And if you go into North Dakota and you primary Heidi Heitkamp, or you go into Missouri and you primary Claire McCaskill, or you primary Joe Manchin, you're going to end up with someone who's going to lose to a Republican in the general election. And you could see a scenario where Trump has close to 60 votes. Because guess what? If they take Heidi Heitkamp out and they replace her with some Michael Moore acolyte, they're going to get murdered in the general election because it's still North Dakota. It's not North Korea. Well, and all it does is expedite uh, what I think is a coming realignment. I think Donald Trump has a unique opportunity to galvanize the constituency that won him this election. We had a lot of white, moderate Democrats who voted for Obama, could not bring themselves to vote for Mitt Romney, two country club, thought John McCain was a little too cranky, uh, and never really bought George W. Bush either in places like Wisconsin and Michigan and particularly western Pennsylvania. Trump was able to get those voters, and he ran 3% better among African Americans than Mitt Romney. Now, you may say, well, that's, you know, that's de minimis. That's almost nothing. Well, it is when seen in the micro, uh, in the macro, but in the micro, it wins you Michigan. It wins you Wisconsin because Trump does better in in both Detroit and Milwaukee than previous Republicans. Marginally better, but he carries those states marginally. I think you could see the... I was going to say, I think you could see the opposite of a 2010 scenario where everyone gave Obama in the first year, at least on the GOP side, you know, as much wide wide a berth to work as as possible, gave him as much deference as possible in, in the circumstances. And he's still, as Democrats are prone to do, uh, absolutely just uh you know overplayed their hand by by uh you know by lengths and ended up blowing their congressional majority i think you can see the opposite with they've come out of the gate so early trying to thwart everything trump is doing that like literally i think you will see a backlash uh in uh 2018 against the democrats that could really cost them uh even a filibuster proof uh you know minority so to speak uh john you yeah, uh I think- go, go ahead. ahead no you go ahead The critical realignment that you talked about is, I think, even more robust than people think, because it wasn't just Trump that came in and did better with all of these groups and won these states that that Romney lost and McCain lost. 
if you go down to the down ballot races, you look at these U.S. Senate seats that we were supposed to lose. We were supposed to lose Wisconsin. We were supposed to lose Pennsylvania. We were supposed to lose uh, other blue or purple states. And Republicans ended up winning those races where they had no business winning at presidential year. And you go down even lower than that to the state legislative races, the Republicans are sitting on the largest numbers they've seen since the 1920s. This critical realignment is real, and I think that it's going to last for a while. Well, now, John, you um, live close to Tinseltown out there, and uh, one of the things um, that has marveled me is I had lunch this past week with the uh, conservative documentary filmmaker Joel Gilbert, who's a good friend, and he just says the atmosphere, the poison atmosphere in Hollywood between the small handful of artists and other creative people who were for Trump uh, and the liberal glitterati is just uh, almost intolerable, he says. What's your reading? Yeah, I think he's right. I think this is the 1970s all over again. I think that in many ways the country hasn't gotten over uh, Watergate, and uh, there's a lot of hurt feelings that are still out there for a variety of things. And Hollywood is filled with sore losers. They lost this election. And I think that when it's one thing to lose when you know you're going to lose because you're conditioned into it. It's like you know, if grandma has cancer and has a slow decline and goes in the hospice and dies, you're, you're conditioned to know that that's going to happen. But if they get hit by, if grandma gets hit by a bus and you had no clue that it was coming and all of a sudden your, your you know, Thanksgiving plans are disrupted and you're never going to see grandma again because she got hit by the bus, you react a different way. They all thought they were going to win. They thought Hillary was going to beat them. And it was going to be an embarrassing defeat, and they were prepared to spike the football and laugh in all of our faces and and really go to town on us. And the fact that they lost, they still can't believe it, which is why they're buying into all of these conspiracy theories uh, that there is a Russian connection, and, and yes. that's, that's why Hillary lost. You, people come up with conspiracy theories when they can't wrap their head around why something happened. And now, I they think are you're, in complete shell shock right now. You're, you're complete exactly shell right. Shock. You make a very good point. That is, this whole Russian thing is a it's a left wing conspiracy theory out of the brain of David Brock and other demented individuals. I mean, it is you know these. I just can't understand these conspiracy theorists. Adding insult to their, their humiliation, though, is the fact that it was Donald Trump. I mean, they have such contempt for this man. I mean, if it had been any other run-of-the-mill Republican candidate, but that's why they've lost their collective minds, is because it is Donald Trump who, you know, not only do they expect him to be defeated, but they have such contempt for him, they expect it to dance on his grave. And quite the opposite has been the, fa- been the truth. So that's why I think they've just resorted to absolute lunatic behavior. All right, John Phillips, KABC, CNN, the smartest guy I know in the political world. Thanks for joining us. And uh, coming up, we have Dr. Corsi uh, and more with the great Tyler Nixon. Thanks for joining us here at the Stone Cold Truth. Tyler, you have anything to add? I I have nothing except this is going to be an exciting show rolling on. And John Phillips was great. Looking forward to uh, looking forward to Dr. Corsi. We are going to have Rick Derringer. He just confirmed. Most excellent rock and roll Hall of Famer Rick Danger joins us here shortly on the Stone Cold Truth. Welcome back. We're here on the Stone Cold Truth, broadcasting from the Stone Zone on the Genesis Communications Network. Uh, and um, one of the key figures in the entire drama over the uh, surveillance on Donald Trump the allegations of Russian collusion between the Trump campaign uh, and the uh, uh, and the Russians, which seem to be leaking out of our intelligence agencies without any foundation uh, in truth or evidence. But one of the key figures has been former um, CIA director John Brennan. Now, Brennan is a very odd character to begin with, because if you go to his wiki Biography. You'll see that he was an active supporter of the Communist Party candidate uh, for President Gus Hall. And after his confirmation as CIA director, he told the reporter he was delighted that he'd been asked the question that way rather than were you ever a member of the U.S. Communist Party. Um, he refused to be sworn on a Bible when he became the CIA director. 
He came to prominence under George W. Bush, but he became director under Barack Obama. That was a bit odd in itself. He is a former station chief at uh, uh, in the, in the Saudi kingdom uh, in Riddha, uh, where many people believe he was flipped and converted to Wahhabism. Uh, he put out a statement last week saying that he is not at the source of the leaks. And as our next guest, George Neumeyer of the American Spectator, can tell you in Washington, when they announced they didn't do something, that means they did it. George Neumeyer, welcome to the Stone Cold Truth. Thanks for having me. So uh, you wrote a terrific uh, piece, a couple pieces really, but most recently a great piece that I recall from The Spectator. Why don't you walk us through where Mr. Brennan fits into all this and really who this character is? Well, yeah, as you were saying, uh, he has a very dubious background. Yeah, he supported the, uh, the American Communist Party at the height of the Cold War, which uh, really should have been a disqualifier for any work in the CIA. He should never have been given a, uh, a security clearance and, and, and should never have been made a CIA agent in the first place. And uh, in addition to what you described uh, him doing in uh, Saudi Arabia, he also in college, he was uh, studying Middle Eastern uh, culture, Middle Eastern studies at uh, in Cairo during college. So his uh, Islamophilia, we can call it, has a has a uh, it goes back a long, long time, and that explains why, as CIA director under Obama, he was such a strong supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood. But with respect to the uh, to the wiretapping claims, he is, I've been arguing for some time now that he is that all roads lead back to John Brennan, that he was the genesis of the investigation into you and Manafort and Carter Page, because he had received this phony intelligence from a intelligence agency in the Baltic, uh, one of the Baltic countries, probably Estonia. And he took that half-baked intelligence to Comey and Lynch and said, we have to investigate these guys. Very interesting. Um, I believe at some point the uh, administration at the Justice Department level went to the super-secret FISA court to ask for a warrant that has now manifest itself in this piece in the smoking gun, which I addressed earlier, a complete hit job, which is devoid of facts, but creates a false impression regarding a contact between me and someone they claim is a Russian asset. Um, Brennan um, had, doesn't seem to be able to lay low. His, either that or he has the worst PR instincts of anyone ever met. I ever met. He was all over the media ten days ago saying he's not the leaker, which is the single best way to draw attention to yourself as the leaker. I found that a bit odd. Um, I also think it's odd that um, that uh, Mike Rogers, the former Tennessee congressman who was briefly uh, ranking on intelligence, um, I was told was one of those who confirmed to Trump that he had been under surveillance, yet he would later go on CNN and say, no, that's a, that's a conspiracy theory. Uh, at the same time, I'm told that Clapper, uh, former uh, director of Inf intelligence under uh, Obama, uh, went to president-elect Trump while he still was in that position with the secretary of defense uh, and demanded that Rogers be fired. So um, it, it is really strange, uh, and I think this is the internal bickering below Brennan uh, in the elitist wing of the Central Intelligence Agency, which, as you know, has held sway. What else uh, about your piece do you think uh, our readers need to know? Well, yeah, another reason why we know that these criminal leaks have been or originated in John Brennan's circle is that he salted the CIA with political radicals. He brought with him to the CIA, or to the directorship of the CIA, he, he brought with him a circle of political radicals. And by lowering standards uh, and fiddling with standards at the Directorate of Operations, he turned a lot of these political hacks into apolitical operatives, according to the classification system. He, he gave them, in effect, career jobs. And these are the guys who make up uh, a large part of the deep state. They're, they're radicals that John Brennan brought into the CIA, and they're the ones who've been um, feeding the press with these criminal leaks, which launched this whole, uh, this whole story and, and led people to think for the last six months or so that the Trump campaign and Russia were in cahoots. 
You know, it is amazing to me, uh, I, I clipped this out at the time, I saw a piece in the New York Post in which Brennan seems to predict the so-called Russian hacks before they happen. Imagine that. Again, this guy's sense of public relations uh, is not good. He may be good at covert ops. He's gotten this far. How he ever got confirmed by the U.S. Senate, given his background, is a miracle to me. How he burrowed his way into the Bush administration is even worse, although they aren't all that different. At least they try to act like they're different. Uh, it's amazing that he has hung on as long as he did. And my sources told me, and I believe this, that he actually uh, uh, had concluded that there was some possibility that Trump would keep him. That part of his anger here is not just the fact that, that you know, Hillary can't deliver her promised expansion of the proxy war in Syria, which I'm sure the boys at Langley are very upset about, but it's just that, that Trump has fired him. Uh, he has quite a, uh, a healthy ego from what I have heard. Yeah, and I mean, and he, the reason he was so eager to take out Michael Flynn is that Flynn was going to expose, probably in all likelihood, Flynn would have, would have exposed the extent to which uh, Brennan has been acting in complicity with the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, all of, you know, his, uh, Bren Brennan's Islamophilia, uh, you know, Flynn, Flynn was uh, in a position to perhaps draw people's attention to that and to, and to the previous administration's uh, coordination, basically, with the world of Islam. And uh, I think that frightened the hell out of him, and he wanted to get Flynn out. Uh, I My God, complete. only Barack Obama could give you an Islamic communist as the CIA director. <laughs> well, I, but I can confirm what George said is, is exactly true. He has that right on the money from my own sources. Uh, I have been very impressed with the American Spectator's reporting on this whole subject, uh, and I salute you for that, George. We are, we are really in a struggle with the deep state. This is a slow-motion coup is really what it is. And those who think that the, that the deep state is going to back off, we have proof this weekend that they don't. This attempt to smear me, which I will most definitely survive, uh, is, uh, is uh, disconcerting to say the least. What I'd like to see is a special prosecutor. I just don't think this can be done uh, by a congressional inquiry. I think that is doomed to become politicized. You can already see Elijah Cummings jumping up and down, insisting that things that don't exist exist and so on. Uh, I'd like to see this, you know, laid out in front of a grand jury. I'm happy to testify, as I've said earlier. Uh, I'm sure Manafort is as well. There's just nothing here to find, and they have to go manufacture things. If I were Brennan, I would lay low. No, George, I'd lay as low as I possibly could. Instead, he seems to be out there leading with his chin. That's right, but but he has not said a word since uh, uh, Trump's tweet last Saturday, you know, and, yeah. and he's been he's been completely silent. As has Loretta Lynch and Comey himself. You know, all we've gotten from Comey was a leaked story saying that he wanted the Justice Department to deny Trump's tweet, but but he's never actually said anything in an appearance or in a press release. So yeah. uh, this is all this silence is very uh, telling to me. Well, I would remind people that the Watergate break-in was in June, and Nixon and his spokespeople so effectively denied this uh, that he won 49 out of 50 states that November. And it wasn't really until a year later, after a year's reporting by the Washington Post and later the New York Times, and the full onslaught of the mainstream media that Nixon teetered and finally was swept from public office. I expect Roger, the cover-up to go on here for a while. But it, well, like the Watergate cover-up, will also be pierced. Well, you can find uh, George Newmeyer's excellent articles at the American Spectator. Uh, we appreciate you coming on. Love to have you back in the future, George. Sure. Thanks for having me. Sure. You're listening to Stone Cold Truth Radio with the great Roger Stone. I'm Roger Stone. And welcome back to the Stone Cold Truth. We're broadcasting from the Stone Zone here at the Genesis Communications Network. I'm at an undisclosed location in South Florida, uh, and um, our, my sidekick and co-host, Tyler Nixon, comes to you from uh, Denver, Colorado, um, where he uh, works as an, a, an advocate, uh, an avocado, as if we were in Italy. Uh, we are uh, really 
very pleased to have um, one of the top investigative journalists in the country. Uh, a guy who has broken so many stories, it, it's hard to remember them all. Uh, and someone who has done extraordinary research uh, on the Obama administration in a dozen public policy areas where they have agreed, done egregious things. He has a series at InfoWars where he is the new Washington bureau chief uh, on Fannie and Freddie and what I would have to call incredible bombshell revelations about the Obama administration and those uh, entities. So, uh, Dr. Corsi, thanks for joining us here at the Stone Cold Truth. Uh, Roger, great pleasure to be back with you. Thank you. Uh, in the second seat tonight, my colleague um, today, my colleague and friend Tyler Nixon, um, who uh, is a uh, nephew, I guess a great nephew of one of our greatest presidents, President Richard M. Nixon, and a distinguished attorney uh, uh, now practicing in Denver, Colorado, uh, and uh, a prolific writer uh, and a thinker. Uh, on the libertarian right. So um, tell us uh, about what you learned. Uh, I see that uh, that Fox Business News picked up your groundbreaking story here, uh, and uh, you really are burning the world up since you joined the crew at InfoWars. Well, thank you, Roger. Uh, this is a huge story. Uh, the Obama administration, starting in 2002, uh, essentially robbed Fannie and Freddie of all their earnings. Uh, this is really important because these two mortgage giants, government-sponsored entities, have private shareholders, and the Obama administration just ripped the all earnings, all dividends, and took them. Uh, shareholders got nothing, uh, which is completely violates all corporate law that I know anything about, and Obama diverted these monies to pay Obamacare insurance subsidies that Congress would not appropriate the funds to pay, which was a complete violation both of the Constitution and, and of the will of Congress. And this story has been festering since 2012. I got into it, and I was astounded with what I found because there's two court cases going and the uh, Obama administration is still trying, now even out of office, to keep 11,000 documents from being seen by the public. Some 50 documents that the courts did open up were bombshells, and court decision this past week looks like the rest may soon be open, which will be devastating, I believe, to the Obama administration. This really, really is extraordinary. So they were basically robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, exactly, and Roger it was astounding. We we got a I got a series of, of Treasury documents that had never been seen before from the period about 2010 2011, and it was clear in the internal discussions the Obama administration had decided they were going to close Fannie and Freddie, take all of its earnings, and they had abandoned middle class home ownership as part of the American dream. Uh, the 30-year mortgage was going to go away. It's all in the Treasury documents, and we were going to become a well-housed nation with the middle class being renters like Europe, and the only government subsidies for mortgages would be the low income, um, just like the money from Fannie and Freddie stolen on the dividends was put into the low income insurance subsidies in Obamacare. These agencies have been the site of some of our greatest scandals. The, the, how, um, for example, the Clinton administration uh, and the stewardship of HUD by Andrew Cuomo walked away without bearing responsibility for a housing crisis that, that virtually wrecked the world economy uh, has always amazed me. I mean, we had, a, we had decided that home ownership was a political objective, and therefore, in essence, we were structuring mortgages that we knew had an immediate uptick uh, in the interest rate and therefore the payments, and we were giving them to people who weren't qualified for them and couldn't service them to, to begin with, knowing full well that they could not service them in the second year if they could even get through year one. But the key thing was to sign them up. 
So we could say that we had, you know, brought all these people uh, housing. It, it, it is amazing the way the New York Times particularly uh, has let Andrew Cuomo particularly and Bill Clinton walk away from that legacy. Uh, now you have well, even that, more shenanigans at, at Fannie and Freddie. And it's always the Democrats. I mean, the Democrats were the ones who engineered the, and Obama was part of that when he was a lawyer in Chicago, forcing banks and mortgage lenders to do these sub subprime, substandard housing loans to low-income families who could never pay the mortgages long-term. And they collapsed. And then remember, Democratic operatives like Franklin Raines and uh, Jamie Gorlick were uh, officers at Fannie and Freddie at this time. They walked away with billions of dollars as the economy collapsed in 2008, 2009 with that scandal. Now we fast forward to 2012. Fannie and Freddie are finally earning money again, and Obama rips it out to pays the stockholders, private stockholders, nothing, and puts the money into Obamacare, where Congress had not a appropriated funds to pay these insurance subsidiaries. I mean, yeah, the whole way the Democrats have treated and dealt with Fannie and Freddie is, has been disgraceful and criminal, going back to the Clinton administration. Uh, Dr. Corsi, I'm going to shift gears on you. We've got about uh, three minutes left, and I want to get into this. Um, do you believe that uh, the Obama administration had the Republican candidate for president, Donald J. Trump, under surveillance? Yes, I, I think the way it was done, and this is how you've got to parse with the uh, what the various intelligence officials are saying, uh, I'm convinced that uh, the Obama administration went on and, and got a uh, FISA approval to wiretap Russian, knowing that that pick up conversations. They really wanted, if there was any contact at all with a Russian, they thought that that would allow them to wiretap Trump and also campaign associates. But see, then you could have uh, Clapper and others of the intelligence chief come out and say, I know there was never a wiretap that Obama had ordered targeting Clapper. Well, first of all, Obama didn't order any wiretaps. That's not how the law's written. Obama might suggest that it be done. Secondly, they were targeting the Russians, knowing that they would pick up Trump and campaign associates. That's why they were campaigning. That's why they wanted to target the Russians. That was just an excuse. And then the Obama administration gave the information for the wiretaps to Hillary Clinton's campaign as campaign intelligence. It's, again, the, another disgraceful story. And the Democrats are parsing their words very quickly, uh, carefully. You know, I didn't have sex with that woman type things. When, in fact, the truth is, and there are reports out before the election, that these wiretaps were done, that Trump was captured in the wiretaps, and the information was given to Hillary. This just keeps compounding itself. Uh, it was interesting that Hillary tweeted only days before the election that, quote, computer scientists have determined that Trump has a server in Trump Tower in contact with a Russian bank. How could she know this? It's amazing. It's like the great Karnak. How should she possibly know this? Uh, this well, is a scandal that will blow. Dr. Corsi, thanks for joining us here on the Stone Cold Truth. Tyler? Well, it looks like we have uh, we have Jenda Derringer coming up next. Rick, unfortunately, can't talk, so uh, we're gonna, that should be interesting to talk about his upcoming tour. I don't know if he's getting his vocal cords rested, but... Uh, we're well, going to have her on, too. Agenda uh, is both lovely and articulate, so I look forward to it. Sounds good. You're listening to Stone Cold Truth Radio. You're on the Genesis Communications Network. Don't go away. This is Reverend Jesse Jackson, and we're listening to the Stone Cold Truth. Thank you, Reverend Jackson, and thanks for joining us again at the Stone Cold Truth. I'm Roger Stone with my co-host, Tyler Nixon, a man uh, who, in the tradition of Ed McMahon, Arthur Treacher, Bud Abbott, <laughs> plays a, a crucial role here at the Stone Cold Truth. Uh, we are we hope to be joined by uh, my friend Jenda Derringer, the beautiful and talented wife of rocker legend Rick Derringer, to tell us about his upcoming uh, tour through Florida. Um, 
Rick Derringer was uh, an outspoken supporter of Donald Trump in the last election. Uh, by his own admission, he began as your typical show business Hollywood, New York liberal. But over time, his eyes were opened and he became uh, an active uh, campaigner for uh, Donald Trump. Um, he's lost many of his friends in Hollywood and in the industry over it, but he doesn't seem to be too upset about that. That's why I like Rick Derringer and why I'm going to be with him next Wednesday night in Orlando when he appears uh, with the Edgar Winter Band, uh, and I am going to open for them. It's not as good as it sounds. Um, so uh, we, although I could step up and do a half-baked rendition of Mustang Sally, I don't know. In any event, um, Tyler, what uh, what are you thinking uh, in terms of how the president is doing? This is the question that I get every day as I move around. Uh, as people who are supporters seem concerned that the constant drumbeat of vilification from the mainstream media uh, is taking its toll. Well, I tell you, Roger, the first thing I thought people thought I was crazy when I first uh, said it w was to compare him to any prior president. He's closest to me, in my mind, to John F. Kennedy in the sense that he has taken on all the forces of uh, institutionalized power and the nefarious sort of deep state underhanded kind of stuff that goes on. And we see what happened with Kennedy. I hope certainly Trump is uh, a little craftier than that. And I, I suspect he is style wise. He couldn't be more different than Kennedy. Uh, although he does, I think uh, Trump certainly has a great deal of magnetism and charisma. I think, if, uh, as you would attest, knowing him personally, that uh, you, you can't help but like the guy after you spend some time with him just because he's so wry and, and has a great sense of humor uh, and takes everything in stride. I got to give him credit for just – I said it to uh, – say, saying to a friend last night, this man has enormous shoulders. I mean, whatever you think of him – uh, you know, hate him, like him. He has shouldered a huge burden and is really uh, just unflappable in so many ways. I think he's starting to settle into the routine of being a president, of uh, being in the White House. And you're starting to see now that he's kind of we've got kind of gotten all the the flash and the glitz and the uh, the initial uh, sort of settling period done. He's able to begin doing what he does best, which is make deals and to get things done and to to uh, to know how to work those channels. I mean, he is schmoozing the right people. He is uh, he's exactly the opposite of Barack Obama, who was prickly, who was effete, who was arrogant, who did not want to, uh, in the sense of doing just just basic retail politics with the people in Congress, with the folks that he needed to. Uh, to appeal to, which is why, of course, you know, he couldn't pass anything with uh, anything close to a bipartisan uh, consensus. It was always just a core of Democrats with often some of them splitting away until he finally blew the entire uh, Democrat congressional majority. Uh, I think Trump is going to just exceed everyone's expectations. And the Democrats always shoot themselves in the foot. They just they really it's unbelievable their arrogance and their uh, isolation in the sense of not really understanding. They're so out of touch. It just amazes me that they they still consider themselves somehow a working class party or the party of the people. It's just they keep pushing themselves further and further into this ideological, hardened, uh, delusional in many ways isolation. And I, I'm I'm thrilled. I can, I love it because frankly they are so they have really just, I think, gone too far in so many ways. And this this now exposure of their uh, connections to the deep state, the intelligence, how they have so infiltrated and corrupted our basic uh, you know, national defense, national security mechanisms in order to, to put it in Clinton-esque fashion in service to their political ends uh, could be their ultimate undoing, I think. But, uh, you know, I believe we have Jenda Der Derringer calling in uh, here. Um, so um, as soon as she's on the line, we can at least maybe get a couple minutes with her and uh, our engineers will let us know as soon as, soon as she's on. But uh, Rick Derringer, I, I had no idea. I mean, hang on Sloopy, rock and roll, hoochie coo, Frankenstein with the Edgar Winter Group. And that's that's one you got to you got to really uh, you got to really get into. I'm, I'm, I'm a little jealous of you, Roger, getting to see Rick Derringer. No, this guy's a rock and roll legend. He's also one of the nicest guys you're ever going to meet. Um, uh, he's an accomplished musician. And if you really went to his list of songs he's written, but that are associated with other artists who made them hits, it's it's really an impressive uh, list. I was very impressed 
to hear that he was playing with the Edgar Winter Band, because in my view, that's probably the preeminent white blues band still playing in the United States. Uh, well, he's both- uh, if you if you go to YouTube, you'll see a video of him playing with Edgar Winter back in the early '70s, and you want to talk about like sort of hair rock and roll, they have you know the hair metal kind of bands. Yeah. But uh, there's some crazy outfits, and boy, you know people have kind of. Hollywood stylizes the 1970s and the in movies they make you know nowadays, but people did not. I mean, the dress back then, boy, it was it was horrific. Well, and, and also while the costuming may not have been good, the, the list of very good white blues singers is really limited. You know, you've yeah. got you've got Joe Cocker, an Englishman. You've got Eric Burden, uh, but after that, it really gets difficult. Uh, all right, all we right. have Jenda on the line. We got unfortunately only a couple minutes left. Jenda, welcome to Stone Cold Truth. Thank you. So, How are you? Uh, excellent, Jenda Derringer, the beautiful uh, and uh, uh, and and uh, highly intelligent and articulate wife of our friend Rick Derringer calls in. Jenda, we really just wanted to tell us about Rick's plans for next week. It's very exciting. I know you're coming to uh, Orlando. Uh, and that he's going to be unveiling yes. a, a song he's quite proud of. So tell us the plan. Okay. Well, we're planning to meet you, as you know, and we'll be there with bells on. Everything's going great. Um, we're looking forward to being together. Um, there's so much to talk about, and I wish we had time to tell you everything, but it'll be a big uh, to-do. It's going to be wonderful, won't it? Uh, I, that's. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, now, your concert is Wednesday night. Is that correct? Do I have this right? Or Thursday night? Yes. Wednesday night. Uh, and you're with the Edgar Winter Band, which is really exciting. Yes. Uh, I okay. I just think I think this is going to be a great uh, venue for Rick. I know a lot of my friends in the Orlando area uh, have bought tickets, and they're very, very excited. So um, yes. I appreciate your coming done, on, saying hello, yeah, telling us, welcome. and we've we will see many, you next week. We've done, we've done many concerts with Edgar. We did Tokyo with him for a week there, and I happen to be walking around with an umbrella, and Edgar is an albino, so I was not thinking, and um, Edgar says, can I borrow your umbrella, Denda? Because it was in July, and it's very sunny and very hot in Tokyo at that time. And so, uh, yeah, that's I know him well, and he's fun to play with, and he's a great intellect as well. Um, they're great intellectuals of, of the rock uh, legend, you know, uh, arena, yeah. Well, Jenda, thanks for coming on, and uh, have a great time on tour. And uh, we look forward to having Rick and you back on the show again sometime soon. You're listening to yes. Stone Cold Truth Radio with Roger Stone and Tyler Nixon. Coming up, Marinara. Hi, this is Bernie Sanders, and believe me, I know you may not believe me, but you gotta believe me. In my opinion, I like the Stone Cold Truth. Welcome back to the Stone Cold Truth. Uh, I'm Roger Stone, your host, uh, with my friend uh, and uh, advisor, Tyler Nixon. Uh, I think we're going to take the show in a slightly different direction, because one of the questions I get when I am out on the road quite a bit, probably because I have texted about this and I've often posted it at Facebook, is um, how do you go about making a proper marinara sauce? In other words, um, what people in Philadelphia would call Sunday gravy. Uh, That is a a sauce that uh, you cook for several hours, usually putting it on Sunday morning and enjoying it for uh, an early dinner Sunday afternoon. At least that is the tradition in an Italian family from Connecticut, namely my family. Um, But there are many iterations and secrets to the making uh, of the proper sauce. Tyler, you have been uh, uh, a guest in the Stone Home, and you have experienced um, our Sunday epicurean adventures um why don't you tell the folks about it i gotta tell you roger i've i've seen i've had some delicious gravies made uh for me in my day my my grandfather's second wife was italian so we you know it was pretty much kind of sort of a tradition that was adopted into our irish german polish uh 
household, but your gravy and the way you put it together is perhaps the finest I have ever had. It really, really was delicious. I, 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 you, if you want to give out the recipe, if you want to talk about it on the air, I'm sitting here with a pen and pad ready to go. Yeah, well, it, I, I'm going to divulge the secret because everybody should enjoy this. And I want to thank you because you read that exactly the way I wrote it. But <laughs> um, the, 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 the key ingredient, though, is love. Well, I, I take one-third uh, ground beef, uh, one-third ground pork, and one-third ground veal, uh, and I put that aside. I then brown um, uh, some onion. This is very controversial, by the way. Many cooks do not add any onion whatsoever to their marinara. I do. So some chopped onions, a couple cups. Um, then uh, after that, the onions become translucent. Then and only then do I add the garlic. Now, uh, I'm looking at three or four, you know, really good sized cloves of garlic, chopped fine, um, and uh, I let that brown just a bit. Then you add your meat, mixing the entire thing together, turning it regularly so nothing burns. You're doing all this on a medium heat. Then the key is to take um, uh, San Marzano tomatoes. San Marzano is not a brand, it is a type of tomato from the San Marzano region of Italy. They're sold in this country by a number of different purveyors, but don't look for the can that says Italian-style plum tomatoes, because that's not what you're looking for. Look specifically for the San Marzano name. Would now, Son take, of Italy have one, be one of those? Uh, I believe uh, that is, but there's a, yep. there's a number of good uh, purveyors. In any event, you take the entire can, including the juice. I like to get the full plum tomatoes uncrushed. Some people prefer them to be crushed in advance, but you dump the entire can in. I would say, given our previous amounts in the recipe, you probably want three cans of tomatoes, including the, the, um, the juice. And then you are adding um, oregano, uh, basil, salt and pepper, and you're there. I mean, that's really it. Now that baby has to cook for a reasonable amount of time. Once you have let it cook, you are, um, uh, and this is the secret, you take one can of tomato paste, you put it in the pot, you take one can of the tomato paste can full of water, you stirred that in carefully, now you're in for the long, low cook, uh, which will bring you a, a truly superior marinara sauce. Now that is my mother's recipe, the, uh, the addition of the tomato paste at the end, I think, makes an enormous difference. But I stress to you, there are many, many different versions uh, of, uh, of a, a good basic red sauce. Joining us now, a man who, in the culinary circles in both New Jersey and Florida, and perhaps certain provinces of New York is a veritable legend when it becomes uh, to his broad knowledge uh, and experience with food. Michael Davis is an entrepreneur by day, but one of the finest Italian cooks, uh, I, I won't even limit it, one of the finest cooks, period, that I've had the privilege to meet. We've traded recipes. Uh, I had to teach him a few things, but... Uh, I, I want him to come on and speak to this because everybody's basic red sauce is different. And it doesn't mean that anyone is particularly right, but I can just tell you, Mike Davis has a red sauce that jumps out of the bowl and bites you in the derriere. It is so good. Michael Davis, welcome to the Stone Cold Truth. Hello, Raj. Thanks for having me. So uh, you're a man who I know is very serious about food. You once told me there was nothing bad, worse than sitting down to a bad meal. And I know you've got a uh, a red sauce that knocks your eyes out. Tell us your recipe. How do you like to go about it? Well, we're, we're talking about just a mononade sauce. Well, it could be uh, the basis for a meat sauce, but the basic red sauce. A uh, basic red sauce is it, it's very simple, and uh, that's how they keep it in Italy. And I like tend to like to cook European and light and simple and easy. And you know, basically, it's it's garlic oil. The garlic is a trick, though. And doing the garlic, it's a slow process. It's not just saute it and brown it. It's actually start to saute it, take it off the heat, put it back on and off quite a few times over about 15 minutes. And that, that 
garlic will actually emulsify. It'll turn into a very soft jelly type of uh, of garlic, and it's actually very sweet to eat. It's not that pungent, you know, uh, hard taste that garlic normally has. And once you do that, turn the heat back up. You add your tomatoes, San Marzano preferably, in a blender. I like to blend them very thin. Uh, because it is a marinade, so it's a nice thin sauce. You put them in a blender, you add your tomatoes, you add fresh basil. Always everything fresh. Very important. Fresh basil, salt, pepper, sugar. Don't be afraid to put some sugar in. It kills the acidity of the tomatoes, adds a little sweetness to it. You shouldn't taste sweet, but the sugar does uh, add a... Uh, a non-acidic component yeah, to yeah, it. I've, I've used brown sugar, sometimes a little dash of lemon juice to try to can't hurt down. You know, I, I, I have a, I have experienced your sauce, and I must tell you, it, it's a triumph. We were talking about this the other day, and I want to hit you up on this. We got about two and a half minutes to go, a little less. One of the my favorite dishes, and one of the most simple, but the easiest to screw up: linguine and white clams. When it's good, it's great. When it's bad, it's terrible. Tell us the Michael Davis recipe. It's the same thing. It's the garlic is very, very important. You know, you want to add the, your, your olive oil and garlic. You want to saute it very slowly. And the pasta has to be al dente. You cannot overcook it. And you get it to a point where that, that, that garlic, again, becomes emulsified. In this dish, you want to add a lot of parsley, a lot of parsley into a, a linguine and clam sauce. You want to little, add a little clam juice, although the clams, when they open, will actually add their own clam juice. They, when they open, they will... They will, uh, they will, you know, drain the, the the juice that's in them. So parsley, garlic, a little salt and pepper. It's really, it's very, very simple. And let the clams open up in the oil. Parsley is important. So you throw the garlic and oil, throw the clams in, let them open up, put the parsley in as they're cooking. It's done. Add your pasta. Important though, when you take the pasta out of the water, make sure you take some of that water and add it into the into the, the mixture of the uh, of the sauté because that starch water will actually add a nice consistency and thickness to the. Uh, to the linguine and clams, but don't burn the garlic, and that's what everyone does, and that's why it's either really good or really bad. Wow. Mike, is it true what Roger's telling all of us that everything you know about cooking, you learn from him? <laughs> well, let's just say let's just say we bounce some great ideas off of each other, and and uh, I have to say Roger is is, is quite quite a great chef. He uh, he's uh, cooked for me on several occasions. Thank, thanks for that, Tyler. I so agree. there you have it, the legendary Michael Davis. If you're lucky, someday you might be uh, invited to dine at his table because it is an experience uh, second to none. Uh, and what I like about eating with Mike is the bread is perfect, the wine is perfect, the order of the dishes is perfect. It, like, this is something we Italians understand, the ritual of eating, the importance of it. It's not something you rush through. It's not something you rush to prepare. It's not something you rush to, uh, to uh, finish and enjoy. So thanks for joining us at the Stone Cold Truth. Where else can you get your a full dose of politics and Italian cookery? Right here with Roger Stone, Tyler Nixon at the Stone Cold Truth. Warning, Roger Stone is a very interesting guy. All right. Thank you, Reverend Jesse Jackson. You're back on the Stone Zone here on the Genesis Communications Network with the ever-capable Tyler Nixon. Uh, in the co-pilot's seat. We're uh, joined now by the uh, stand-up comedian, uh, freedom fighter, libertarian, uh, bon vivant, man about town, uh, Tyler, uh, Tyler's friend and mine, Travis Irvine. Travis, welcome back to the Stone Cold Truth. Roger, good to be with you as always, and thanks so much for having me. Uh, glad you're safe and sound from your time on the road. Well, that's so, a great all, connection they have from that Mexican prison. Yeah, you, you, seem to be doing, <laughs> you seem to be doing well. First of all, I want to start out by congratulating you on a smash a week at the Cleveland Comedy Cave. I understand you broke all records. Uh, and uh, tell us where your schedule takes you next. Well, absolutely. Uh, uh, as you know, Roger, uh, Cleveland Comedy Cave, has taken me now to Central America. I've been on tour with uh, a group called Comedy Abroad out of Montreal, and they've been doing uh, comedy shows to raise money for local nonprofits in Central America. Um, of course, this is not a cheap endeavor, and uh, of course, uh, I always tell everyone that Roger Stone was uh, very kind to make a gracious donation 
to Comedy Abroad uh, back during our fundraiser time in December. So that's helped us uh, get down here and and raise over twenty five thousand dollars in a, in the course of three years for uh, at over six different nonprofits here in Central America, across Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and now Mexico for the first time. So uh, that's a lot of money. You know, 25000 down here in Central America uh, goes a long way, and it, it does a lot of good things for kids and uh, for a lot of people struggling here in Central America. So thank you guys so much for the for those donations and for the time to, to, uh, to support this cause. Tonight we're performing at a great barbecue joint uh, run by Americans here in Mexico City called Pinche Gringo. We're raising money for Teco Mexico. They build uh, houses for poor folks in poorer areas of Mexico. And we're off to Playa del Carmen next week to uh, wrap up the tour. And then I will uh, see you guys back in New York City uh, for Stone Cold Truth next week. I don't want to say anything, but the whole thing sounds like a scam to me, an excuse to get some enchiladas. I mean. <laughs> well, they do have amazing food here. I, I got to say, I've never been to Mexico City, and it's an absolutely beautiful city, uh, cultural, artistic, historical. Um, and really, I've been blown away. Uh, you know, I attended the uh, International Women's Day demonstration, made some videos for media, and obviously people there we're necessarily uh, fans of, uh, of uh, your friend Donald Trump, but I was blown away by the fact that the Mexicans here hate their, their own president, Enrique Pena, even more. Uh, Pena has a 16, 16% approval rating here in Mexico. Uh, I don't think it could get much worse than that. So, uh, you know, it's kind of fascinating. Going forward, maybe uh, President Trump can uh, kind of speak out more against the Mexican government than just Mexican citizens themselves. I think Mexican citizens, they like the United States. They want to like Donald Trump. Um, but, you know, they're, they're in a position a lot of foreign countries are, where their government is so corrupt. Pena has been very corrupt, uh, pay-for-play scandals, uh, breaking promises. And, uh, you know, if anything, 2018, maybe uh, Trump can help get a, a, a president in Mexico that he can actually work with. Like Carlos Slim? I've heard that uh, Carlos you know, Slim is thinking about dropping his hat in the ring, and there's a popular movement for him to run. Of course, Slim. Yeah, you know, the I've been talking to world. Po- right. I, I have talked to people here about that because his name was floating around. Um, that, I he's also denied that he'll do it, but um, that would be fascinating, right? I mean, the the man who has taken the New York Times in such a terrible, untrustworthy uh, direction. Um, becoming president of Mexico, I don't think that would be good for anybody. Well, it would it would be kind of the Mike Bloomberg model, as it were, of a corporate titan who then goes into public office. Um, I, I can't imagine why he would want to do it. One, he already controls the Mexican government. And B, why does he need that kind of scrutiny? But look at Berlusconi. Anything, I guess, is possible. Yeah, maybe he's bored with his billions and just wants to do a Wants some more notoriety, maybe to face down Trump. That'd be a tough. That'd be a difficult problem to have, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, is he not like the second or third richest man in the world, or something like that? Yeah, I think he was the first. Uh, but he lost <laughs> after Trump's election. He uh, he he bet on a lot of. Uh, let's say let's say he shorted. I believe a lot of stocks that would have been, uh, you know, would have suffered had Trump. Uh, had Trump not won, so he I mean, lost. He is, the, he is like, the largest single donor to the Clinton Foundation, which I think yeah. I've thought for some time. He lost uh, billions, billions exactly. after Trump got elected, literally. So, Ab- but you know, absolutely. But, and, uh, and let's not forget. Oh, sorry, I was going to say in 2013. Um, you know, I worked on a, a James O'Keefe Project Veritas report that uh, also singled out uh, Carlos Slim's a mobile phone company was the benefactor of the. The uh, ill-fated uh, Obama, Obama phone things. program, where they gave uh, free phones to anybody who couldn't afford it. You know, like any good government contract, that was uh, Carlos Slim making those phones and getting money, taxpayer money, uh, from American citizens to uh, to give all these folks phones. So, and let's, yeah, let's, he's, remember, uh, let's remember Carlos Slim's partner in that endeavor, track phone, Jeb Bush. Yeah, Another exactly. example of the of the uh, the uh, Bushes profiteering on their personal connections. Well, as, as President Trump said, 
when the Mexicans send people, they don't send their best, they send rapists. But clearly, Travis being in Mexico indicates that we send our best to Mexico, Travis. But let's talk about what is the weed like down there? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, hopefully uh, there's, uh, there's no Mexican uh, Policia Federal uh, listening. Uh, by the way, I have heard from friends here that uh, the Policia Federal here in Mexico are, are beyond corrupt. Uh, they make uh, American uh, police look look polite. Um, they've actually, I believe, have one of the highest murder rates in terms of killing their own citizens. So that's, it's a very unlibertarian police force here. But, um, well, look, uh, I'll just talk about, you know, I'm a comedian, and after the shows, uh, some people uh, come well, up me to stop, me. And, let, let me stop you right there, Travis, and just say that Tyler and I are concerned about your medical condition. And it bothers us that you'd be out of the country and not have access to your regular medicinal marijuana. Okay, I just set you up. Take it from there. That's right. That's right. Thank you. As you know, I have insomnia. I I can never sleep uh, without a a good dosage. And, um, you know, across Central America, uh, I'd say Costa Rica has uh, some of the worst. Uh, Nicaragua has some of uh, the second worst. Um, it's all very uh, tropical weed, which is uh, <laughs> an interesting thing to think about, that it doesn't actually grow well here. It's, uh, it's very, they call it dirt weed. It's more brown. It's got seeds. It's, it's got weed. stems. It's definitely not what uh, Tyler would be used to in, uh, in Denver. But uh, I'll just mean. say that, <laughs> yeah, I just say that here in Mexico, we've, we've done all right. They've done a lot better. But uh, that being said, I still wish they would end the drug war and, take out these cartels they would eliminate uh, their billions of dollars in profits in the black market and uh, take out a considerable amount uh, of a considerate amount of their power that they have over the Mexican government and the people here well, well like um, everything America does we do it best in the world and American cannabis is the finest on planet earth period well that I cannot speak to I do have a concern as you know that the Trump administration is uh, who say they are for states' rights when it comes to medicinal marijuana are taking this odd position that states' rights are meaningless in the states that have legalized uh, recreational marijuana. There's an inconsistency there that d- seems to escape Attorney General Sessions. Uh, just the sorting it out would be impossible because, of course, in the states where medicinal and uh, recreational are both legal, the tax rate on medicinal marijuana is far lower. Yeah, it's, how, you it's, would, it's, how you would do this from a bookkeeping point of view makes no sense. But it's a bloody mess, succeed? Roger. And I'll tell you what, uh, Justin Amash, well, he's one of the co-sponsors, but uh, a, a freshman congressman from Virginia, along with Gold, uh, Tulsi Gabbard and Jared Polis here from Ohio, have introduced H.R. 1227, which is the End Federal uh, Cannabis or Marijuana Prohibition Act, which essentially deletes marijuana and tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, the active ingredient, deletes it from the Controlled Substances Act entirely. Great piece of legislation. Let's hope it makes it. That, oh. that sounds, you know, that that's a great part of the holy alliance of progressives from the left and libertarians from the right and the drug war. It's a it's a it's a compassionate issue. It's a fiscally conservative issue. It's the right thing to do. It's states' rights, just like uh, Roger was saying. I hope the Trump administration gets this one right. Amen, brother. Well, it's been uh, it's been great having you with us, Travis. Uh, it's all, it seems all too short. We'll look forward to you next week. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. And sure. grab a couple tamales for me, will you? You got Roger. it, Roger. Oh, yep. Many thanks. Closing thoughts, sir. Uh, last minute, folks, you can go to Amazon.com. You can go to BarnesandNoble.com. You can go to RogerStone.com. You can go to StoneColdTruth.com and get The Making of the President 2016. How Donald Trump orchestrated an American Revolution. Thank you. Peace and freedom. And above all, victory or death. <laughs>